found that the more I became an autism mom, a special needs parent advocate, the more I saw gaps and holes. Um, and the problem with somebody having a learning disability or any kind of challenge is that um, they're underestimated. And I know for my own son, the more you tell him and me that we can't do something, the more it lights a fire in our belly and we want to do it. So my life over the past 16, 17 years since he got his diagnosis mm -hmm. is to spread um, the message of acceptance and inclusion. It's very easy to say no. It's over. You said no, we parted ways, no harm, no foul. The minute you say yes, as a teacher, a therapist, an entrepreneur, now you have to actually go to work and do what you said you were gonna say yes to. So right. I, I feel like it's my job and other parents of typical kids and kids with special needs need to always be that fierce mama lion. Hey friends, I'm your host, Anya Smith. Today we're tapping into the essentials of advocacy entrepreneurship, which is storytelling, branding, and media engagement. We'll unpack how these powerful tools can drive change and foster inclusion, especially for those with autism and special needs. We have insights from major outlets like Parade.com, NextAvenue.org, Suburban, Life Magazine, Emerson, and Yahoo Live. Our discussion is set to inspire. Please welcome our guest, Deborah Wallace, an award-winning journalist celebrated for her impactful advocacy and work. Deborah, so grateful to have you here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And for our audience, maybe those in familiar work, can you tell us about what got you started in this space and where is your passion right now doing this work? I went to journalism school. Uh, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, it's mm -hmm. something that I knew from the tender age of eight or nine. Uh, and um, I wanted to be a writer, um, not just to get my name published, but to make a difference in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've written about domestic abuse and mm -hmm. I've written about um, child advocacy and I've written about... Um, seniors and, and all the kind of forgotten, quote unquote, throwaway groups, and mm -hmm. really try to raise a lot of money uh, for various health problems. And um, as the mom of an 18 year old son with autism, um, it's really become my passion to use my gifts and talents as, as a writer and a content provider. Uh, I rewrite websites. Uh, I write for a lot of local, national, and, and uh, regional magazines. And, uh, and I also do publicity uh, for entrepreneurs and authors and people who are getting their feet wet and people who have been doing this for 20 years like I have. Mm -hmm. And I found that the more I became an autism mom, a special needs parent advocate, the more I saw gaps and holes and um, and the problem with somebody having a learning disability or any kind of challenge is that um, they're underestimated. And I know for my own son, the more you tell him and me that we can't do something, the more it lights a fire in our belly and we want to do it. So my life over the past you know, 16, 17 years since he got his diagnosis mm -hmm. is to spread um, the message of acceptance and inclusion and also raise a lot of money, find different programs. It's very easy to say no. It's over. You said no, we parted ways, no harm, no foul. The minute mm -hmm. you say yes, as a teacher, a therapist, an entrepreneur, now you have to actually go to work and do what you said you were going to say yes to. So right. I, I feel like it's my job and other parents of typical kids and kids with special needs need to always be that fierce mama lion mm -hmm. that's going to go that extra mile and say to the school district, uh, the principal, anybody in our child's lives, why not? You've mm -hmm. always done it this way. He can't go on the class trip because there isn't blah, blah, blah. Let's find 
those tools. Let's find those things we need and get him or her on the class trip and get them as integrated as possible. I love, I love so much of that. And the theme of being underestimated, I think is so broad. Right. And obviously people have different variants to that feeling that way, but I can see how much it relates to entrepreneurship where there's so much of society telling you what you should be doing, how you should work, how you should make money. And when you start to say, you know what, I feel this pull towards something different. A lot of people are like, why would you do that differently? How can you do that? Like, who are you to do things like challenge the conventional path? So I'm curious with all of your experience, what advice would you give to somebody who is in that, posi in that position of feeling like they're underestimated or maybe people who um, or are in the positions of power and how maybe can they, they rethink their limited view on like underestimating people? So from both of those angles, what advice would you have? We have to be mentors to people who are coming along and we have to allow ourselves to be mentored. And so it definitely takes a village to raise a child um, with special needs. And you have to surround yourself with the people who are going to help you make whatever this possible. Uh, yes, restaurants fail, startups fail, you know, and people will get you scared. They'll tell you 10 reasons why you should not pursue whatever it is that you want to. But if you really, uh, and you may fail, you have to be willing to fail. But um, once you say, this is my passion, this is what I want to do, uh, you know, definitely have a good business plan. You know, if, if math isn't your thing, then get an accountant, like get the people behind you that know how to do media relations, that know how to do social media, that know how to do editing or, or whatever you need. But um, once you decide, this is my path, this is my business plan, this is my goal, um, find people who support it. And I'm not telling you to not speak to your sister-in-law or, or your neighbor, but don't keep those people as your close knit. You know, you want to have people who celebrate you, who celebrate the dream, uh, you know, whether that's a, a child or a business or a book, whatever it is, it's much easier to just dismiss the whole thing and say, you know, do you know the possibility of, you know, of your restaurant making it past six months or a year. Okay. But, but what about me? I have strengths. I have background. I have people in my corner. So let's be supportive of one another and see, I never give up. You know, you'd have to tell me no 300, 600,000 times. Um, I was told that having a bar mitzvah for my special needs son in 2019 was a pipe dream that he wasn't going to be able to do the prayers. He wasn't going to be able to have the focus. He wasn't going to be able to spend an hour and a half to two hours in front of a congregation. People were scared for him. People were thought I was crazy and I made it work. And he was wonderful. And he was a Jewish rock star. And um, the, the teachers and the family and the friends and the therapists in the congregation applauded at the end. And people said, is that typical for somebody to applaud at a uh, synagogue service? And I said, only when appropriate. And we were just so proud of him. And, and I said to him, you've set a no, new bar. So as you're going through this, set littler goals and littler steps. So you want to write that book in a year, year and a half. So say you want three chapters in the first three or four months, like give yourself little chunky goals to, to master and then move on to the next one. So, um, yeah, he was amazing. And, you know, it was whatever we created. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be, everybody wants us and our children with special needs to fit into boxes. And this is the way school goes and this is the way work goes and this is the way um, play dates go or whatever. And our children don't fit in these boxes. Right. And I feel like, you know, stop making people fit in boxes. That's where the creativity, that's where the imagination, that's where the childlike vision comes in. Just let them be, let them thrive. And my goal for Adam is that um, my son is that he is the best version 
the best Adam that he can be. I don't need him to, to do anything for someone else or someone else's um, vision of, of what he could do or, or can't do or whatever. Um, so I'm very encouraging. I'm very supportive. And um, I think with a lot of love and a lot of passion, we all have gifts. We all have talents. We all have things we're great at. We all have things that we're not great at. And I just feel like allow yourself to feel self-confident, to feel self-worth, to know that you have something to offer and just go for it. Um, my definition of success is different than a lot of people. I interview a lot of successful entrepreneurs, uh, celebrities, people, um, movie people and business people and people, Fortune 500 companies. And I say, I ask them, what is your definition of success? And I've come up with one that fits for me and Adam. Giving it your best. Study hard for the test. Give it 110%. Study a little bit more on the bus. Do everything you can and then get a grade. A, B, C, D, it doesn't matter. You gave it your all, you succeeded. I keep saying this to my son over and over and over again. You, success is not getting the results you want. Success is giving it all your heart and all your soul and all your love and then stepping back and taking a deep breath. You did what you could. Yeah, that's so beautiful. and. Just kudos to Adam. He sounds amazing. I know he's amazing and he's he's shining to his to himself. And I love that he has you as an example of just not being underestimated. But more importantly, not to prove to others, but to like live this definition of success that you internalize and you're showing up and having giving him the same, you know, environment. Like, hey, this is what success is, and this is how you shouldn't underestimate yourself either. So beautiful. And it reminds me of this theme of control. And I and I grappled with it for a while where there's a sense like I want to be in control, but there's also a realization that you can't control everything, right? And and so people who try to control everything become well, unhappy and suffering because they, again, they, it's a losing battle. But where I come to this medium point of you can control the effort you put into something and you have to find peace or grace or whatever you want to call it around accepting the things around you are really happening. Like you can, you are in control of how you react to things, but you can't control everything that's external. So like finding that balance and to your point, the definition of success that you create for yourself is going to create that ability for you to like define like how, how you want to show up as your definition of being in control. So very recently uh, I had a birthday um, the day after Valentine's day and I woke up to, um, a sewer leak in my basement, mm. terrible birthday. And I used it as a teaching moment. I said, I am upset. You know, this is a mess. I have to make a lot of plans to get it cleaned up, spend a lot of money, deal with the insurance company, but I'm still going to have a birthday. I'm still going to celebrate. I'm still going to have a party and how I choose to mm. go through that day or that weekend is up to me. The thing already happened. I can't get rid of the problem, but so, you know, when it was time to go out to dinner with some friends and my son that we had already planned, there was a part of me that said, why bother? You know, mm -hmm. let me just get into bed and watch a Hallmark movie with a cup of tea and a magazine and just pretend today didn't happen. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that to him. I couldn't do that. You know, it was a nice dinner. Was I upset? Yes, but I compartmentalized it. And I tried not to think about it. And I 90% of the dinner was totally enjoyable. So it's the choices that we make once, you know, things happen. I, somebody made a toast at Adam's Bar Mitzvah and it's been my um, catchphrase. Life has given me lemons, bushel fulls of lemons. My beloved husband of 22 years uh, passed away, um, 12 years ago tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, in March at the tender age of 57. He was our guy. He was an amazing dad. My son was six and people said, how did you get out of bed after the funeral, after the people went home, after things got calm? I said, well, first of all, I was now a single mom in charge of a home, in charge of a six-year-old 
never really lived alone. I always had roommates and, you know, went from my parents' house to college to, you know, to getting married later in life. And um, I didn't feel like I had a choice. You know, one doctor said, would you like some, um, something to help you sleep, sleeping aid? And I said, with a six-year-old in the next room? Like, that's a really bad idea. Unless I'm going to get live in help. Like, that's not going to work. He needs to be able to have a, if he has a nightmare in the middle of the night or he needs a glass of water, I have to be alert. So I took those lemons. I mean, and they could have filled this kitchen. And I made the sweetest lemonade, you know, in terms of work, in terms of the home, in terms of getting those people around us. You know, there were people who kind of, went away. You know, I don't know if they thought losing a spouse was catchy or, or whatever. They just didn't want to deal with us. You know, we had autism, we had a death in the family. We had a lot on our plate. And the people who said, we want to be here for you and, um, and really stepped up. I, my big advice, if somebody's having a problem in their life, a death, a tragedy, something's bad happening, don't say, let me know if I can help you. Let me know what I can do for you. Just be there and, and invite that person out for coffee or a lunch or, you know, we're not talking about a $300 meal here. We're just talking about being there for them, listening. And those people who were there 12 years ago are still in my life because they cared enough about me back then. They still care about me. Some of them have children with autism and special needs, and I've tried to help them advocate advocate, and tried to, you know, there's a whole learning curve once you find out your child has special needs. I don't care if it's autism, Down syndrome, uh, physical disability, whatever. And, and people kind of keep all these things hidden. And when um, people call me out of the blue all the time, my child or my grandchild or my neighbor was just diagnosed and we're going to wait. We're going to wait for the speech, speech therapy. We're going to wait for the occupational therapy and the behavioral therapy and all this other stuff. And you don't want to wait. Waiting is, is the worst thing you can do. You want to just get in there with your feet first and, uh, and start, start helping the child as early as you can. What I took away from that is that when things are challenging, when the things are easy, it's easy to be around people, right? You can, you can have these superficial relationships. And then when things get challenging, it's harder to look at the challenge, right? You have to, you have to make a choice that whether you're going to lean in and really be there or if it's too hard and you step away. And I think those are also defining moments. Like when we choose to do something challenging, whether it's, you know, again, decide a new path or take on like the you, you're representing a cause that's dear to your heart, right? And some people may find it easier to look away. And it's like, well, this is outside my comfort zone. I don't want to have this conversation. I'm easy being in the box and that's comfortable for me. And I'm curious as a, somebody who is a champion of a, of cause that's, you know, again, could be uncomfortable to talk about what advice would you give to people like entrepreneurs who want to talk about meaningful causes to them? Like what strategies have you found that are effective in helping people who, again, maybe looking in, maybe are in their comfort boxes, but still get them involved in something that's meaningful to the person. One of my um, most successful avenues as a publicist is to go to a client who has a book or a product or a brand or a business and say, what is important to you? What has touched your family or your community, you know, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, um, it could be anything. And once they say, well, this happened to my mother or my mother-in-law or somebody that, that I care about, embracing that in as big a way as you can. So, you know, having an event at your place, if, if there is a place of business, like um, we had a bagel fundraiser and we raised quite a bit of money for the local autism group, which was down the street. Now this particular business owner didn't have anybody with autism in his life. He had healthy kids and he was happy, um, but he, but it's a very important um, part of our community. 
And so I suggested the autism fundraiser. He certainly could have picked something else. So find something that's touched your heart, something that's happened to you or someone in your life and just get involved. You know, whether you raise $10 or $10 million, it's a start. And you will find a network of like-minded people who are interested in the fundraising and the awareness because uh, it's not just about the money, it's getting the message out and they will be interested in turn and in, in maybe helping you grow your business. So it's a great match. You're doing good for the community. You're also helping your own business and you're, um, whenever I interview somebody for any publication, it's big or small, I ask what gets you excited about getting out of bed in the morning? What do you look forward to? And they don't usually say making a lot of money, uh, you know, getting a better house, getting a, you know, a fancy car. They say, you know, being the best mom or grandma or community member or involved in the school, like making a difference, mm -hmm. making a difference in my community, through my business, through my passions. And um, once that connect is there and there's a reason um, I, it, it sort of goes back to public speaking. I'm, I'm revamping, uh, with this podcast and, and, and my own future podcast, um, my motivational speaking. And what I want people to understand is if it's, if it's in your heart and it's important to you, then other people will, will want to go along for the ride and they'll be happy to go along for the ride and it'll be successful. So when I interview everybody from Henry Winkler and John Travolta and Brooke Shields and Margaret Atwood and, you know, Jane Goodall and Temple Grandin, like really major movers and shakers, the one thing that most of them want to know about is Adam and why autism awareness is so important to me and what the holes are in our community and, and in our nation and in our world. So, um, so I write a lot about autism and I also write a lot about not being underestimated, no, no matter who you are, you know, whether you're a young woman who can't go to community college because you have young children to take care of and, and, you know, and there's no man in the picture or, um, you know, your homeless person or, or anything you know, what can we do as a community, as a society to help you get where you need to go and to use whatever gifts and talents for our business, um, for whatever our platform is to give back? Because that's what gives me the most joy is seeing the difference. So when I have a yard sale, I don't just set up a bunch of tables and sell a bunch of stuff and make a couple dollars. We set up a snack table that my son is in charge of and I buy juice and I buy lemonade and cookies and crackers and, and water. And some people don't buy anything from me and they don't want the crackers and the juice, but they just want to donate. And so to me, that's a successful yard sale, whether I make $20 or $600 because I raised whatever it is for autism and, and Adam can go and donate that money to the local autism Caris foundation and, and see that they can have a Lego class or sensory friendly movie or some kind of outing because his, mm -hmm. you know, contribution helped. And yeah. I don't think that a contribution can be too small. I, I really don't. If we care and we're involved and we keep talking about it and we keep getting people involved, uh, then, then we've made an impact. And that's, that's the point. That exactly. to me is the point. So many killers. I love I love this interview because there are so many parallels I see. And what it reminds me is that oftentimes people don't make an impact or don't even start because they feel like, oh, well, it has to be this grand vision, right? This paralysis of inaction because we set our sights and like we, we put our worth into the outcome versus saying there's value in what I'm doing in the mission and like the, every step is valuable. And I appreciate every step and what I'm doing in itself is important. And you mentioned that a lot of people reach out to you and you've interviewed some incredible people. And it keeps me going back to the theme of authenticity. 
and how I'm sure there are people who you see, read the message like, okay, this is powerful because it's authentic. I sense your energy. I sense your drive. And I'm sure there are times where you're like, eh, this is landing kind of flat. <laughs> like, I'm not sure if this is going to have an impact. So what advice would you have for entrepreneurs or people listening to us who want to show up powerfully, make impact and potentially be, I mean, how does it, how does authenticity tie into them being impactful uh, when working with you or just trying to grow their media presence? I think they have to be realistic. You you have to know what your goals are. You know, when I'm looking for a uh, public relations client and they say, well, I want to be on Good Morning America and I want to be interviewed by Oprah Winfrey and I want to sell 5 million copies of my book and I need to make this amount of money. And I was like, that's all lovely, but that's big. If your name is not James Patterson or Taylor Swift or whatever, you're probably not going to do all that in the beginning, at least. So we have to set our sights on, you know, some local publicity, some local uh, opportunities and just um, give yourself grace. You know, there's going to be a day where you're going to go to a chamber meeting or, try to attract an investor and, um, and you know, your toilet backed up or, you know, something bad happened or your kid, you know, came home from school in tears and you're one person. You can't really compartmentalize all the bad things or all the difficult things that are going in, mm -hmm. on in your life. You know, it's kind of like make sure that you don't overlook the snow days. So a snow day for us means no school. We have to shovel. We have to tone it down. We're not going to get all the work done. And we could complain about that. Or we could just go outside and have a snowball fight, maybe build a snowman and shovel mm -hmm. and just say to, you know, whoever, you know, my, my, um, my laptop's not going to work today. Uh, let's postpone our meeting till tomorrow. We just had a snow day and send them a lovely picture, you know, uh, that looks like a Hallmark postcard. Like just be able to adapt to what's going on. And people will not see it as weakness. If you say, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in my life. And um, I've had people say there was a family emergency or, you know, if the school calls, I will finish what I'm doing but I'm not going to start the next thing, even if it's just to say hi, because when the school calls, I'm a mom, I have to be on duty. You know, moms really don't get much of a break. So give yourself grace, be excited, be authentic, and then admit that there's going to be tough days. And, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you failed because you gave it your heart and people will see that. I'm so, sorry. Um, I really believe with, with the right mindset and the right people and the right, um, attitude, it's, it's so much easier to say, I can't be a journalist anymore. Mm -hmm. Digital took away most of the print and the money isn't as good as it used to be. And when that day came where I was kind of reevaluating who I was writing for and magazines were closing. I wrote for Family Circle, they're gone. I wrote for Red Book, they're gone. I wrote for Ladies Home Journal, they're gone. But there's still a lot out there and most of it is digital. And I had to learn how, a different way of writing, you know, with subheads and shorter uh, materials mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So don't say, I only know how to do this, this, this. My mother learned how to you know, work a computer very successfully, you know, in her 60s and 70s and used one, you know, until um, she passed it, you know, age 89. So, you know, find out what you don't know, find people to help you uh, navigate and, uh, and be willing to, to change um, because public relations came about because people came to me and said, we enjoy your writing, you write with heart. We love your stories. Would you be willing to write copy for us, for our websites and for these different campaigns that is more public relations oriented than just, you know, organically grown, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, after COVID, most of the publications I wrote for were on a hiatus. 
They thought they were going to close down for six weeks. Some of them were gone for six months to a year and a half. And, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, you have to make a living. You have writing skills. So look at your skills as a business owner or whatever it is your passion is and say, well, I tried this and it didn't quite work the way I wanted, but I have all these other skills. What, how can I package them? How can I offer them? And how can I work with other people and maybe make a team? So if social media is, is uh, your best friend or your neighbor's forte and somebody else has a bakery and somebody else get together and see how you can all work together to make your businesses successful. You can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. Uh, you know, as a single mom, you know, that was the biggest thing. I knew I needed help. And um, my husband had a great theory. If somebody came to our house to work with our son or do anything, he would give them three to six weeks. If they weren't getting the results that we were looking for, we, we didn't blame them. We didn't condemn them. We didn't give them a bad Yelp review. We just said, we're going to try something else. Mm -hmm. And, and it worked. So if you're not getting the results that you want from whatever you're doing, try something else. Yeah. And, and don't put all your eggs in one basket for crying out loud, because, you know, what if that person leaves the business or, you know, that company that's servicing you and helping you do X, Y, Z just doesn't want to do it anymore for whatever reason. Um, you've got to have other backups. And um, so have a plan, take a deep breath try a lot of different things and, and learn to zig and zag. And when those lemons come your way, just get the sugar and make sweet, sweet, sweet lemonade. Because if you're going to be bitter about it, it's just not going to work. Ugh. I, I'm loving so much. There's so much again in here about building community and also pivoting and being graceful to yourself wherever you're at as a mom with three little boys, well, somewhat little one, four and 11 now. So not little, I, I it's easy to say, okay, I can't do this. I can't be an entrepreneur. I can't do it because I have to be, you know, doing X, Y, Z. And I also found that being an entrepreneur actually is making me part of a community where people really understand the challenges. Like no community quite like this. Have I found where when you tell people like, I am just feeling overloaded. I can't function. Like I get you. I've been there yesterday. So <laughs> Get back to me when you're feeling better. And to your point, like when you when you open up to people in an authentic way and you find yourself around people who are also authentic about their challenges, it becomes somewhat easier to say, like, hey, I'm open to pivoting because I see this is normal. Like this this assumption that everybody has everything together and everybody's on the straight path and it's working for them is a mirage, I think, a lot of times. Most times people who are figuring out who are, who are you know, sane – are giving this a loss of grace. They're owning where they're at, defining connections that allow them to be genuine where they're at. And also, again, they're taking things in stride. So when it's a day where you feel energized and good, cool. But when things are not going well, they're like, okay, well, this is a day for me to be a little slow. I'm going to be attuned to this environment and adjust accordingly. So, so much there. Um, Sorry, I was going to say one thing that you spoke about is like this example where somebody comes to you like, I want to do everything. I want to be on the best show, 5 million copies. Um, and you said like, hey, you can get there, but we have to start somewhere else. So what if what is a more realistic approach for somebody who is starting out? Maybe they're not new entrepreneur. They're maybe they're new to this media space. What would be some of the things you'd recommend for that person to be seen and also start making progress? Uh, if you don't have an email list, of people in your community or in your particular space, start one. Start with five people and build it up. So the first thing I ask a new client is who in your business community, uh, family, personal community, church, whatever, uh, is in the media? Do you know anybody who has a podcast, who has a radio show, uh, who's on local TV, newspapers, digital? write down those names and emails. And if you haven't contacted them in a, in a while, um, send them an email. Mm -hmm. I'm going into business. 
I'm going to be selling salad spinners and this is why, and this is why I love them. And I take them to the nursing home, tell them a story, tell them why this is important to you. And I would love to get your thoughts or advice or opportunities or whatever. Start sending those emails so that by the time you hire me or another publicist to start sharing your story on these different venues, you will have some people to share it with because knowing the person, there's a connection there and finding that connection, whether you went to the same college or the minute somebody hears I'm from Chicago, we spend the first five minutes talking about growing up in Chicago and the food in Chicago and the weather in Chicago. So you have touch points, which I learned is a marketing term from a good friend of mine who's into marketing. Um, you have things that people have in common. So we have children. So we're both mothers, you know, um, anything that somebody, you know, obviously everybody has a family. Um, and some of these causes are, are a touchstone. If, if you know somebody is involved in the Alzheimer's community or senior rights or, or any of these things, even politics, these are things that you have in common. So start building a list of emails. And if you know the person really well, and you think that they, somebody can help you get on your local news or in your local, you know, um, lifestyle magazine, pick up the phone, um, send an email, follow up it. Nothing happens in a vacuum. If you don't follow up those emails and calls, then you're just one of 20 or 300 people that reached out that day. So if it's important to you, stay on top of it, keep a list, check it off this, you know, yeah, you're going to get no's and you're going to get people who say, I can't help you, or I don't know what you're talking about, or I don't have the time, or I'm going to, you know, Luxembourg next week and I'll check back with you the 12th of never, but I never get discouraged. It, it's always one step forward. And, um, so start with those people who might be able to help you go to a chamber meeting, go to a women's networking meeting, belong to, I belong to six writers organizations and three public relations organizations. And it's all about networking. And people say, why in God's green earth would a publicist who's competing with you, that's what people say, want to give you advice about um, prices or packages or anything that they offer? And I said, um, that's a good question because I go to people on a pretty regular basis and we have a little brainstorming and I was like, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm pretty likable and we have a good time, but maybe they want to, uh, me to owe them a favor that I'm going to come back. Maybe they're going to have a difficult client that they can't do anything with that. Nobody likes anything about them. And maybe I can do something that'll make their client happy. I don't know, but I do it on a regular basis and people tell me, you know, what their prices are. So I know I can be competitive. They tell me what their game plans are. They tell me what they do for, you know, difficult clients and happy clients. And we just share information and sure, maybe I'll reach out to 10 people and one or two won't have the time or, or won't be interested. So start thinking about who can help you on this journey both in the sense of a media uh, and um, I mean, if your brother-in-law does public service announcements for WHYY, um, which is the TV, PBS TV in Philly, for God's sake, call him and say, I want to do something like that. Can you help me get in to WHYY? And, mm -hmm. and always look at what's in your backyard. So no matter where you are, you know, from California, Arizona, anywhere in the country and the world, there are local resources. There are little newspapers, there are regional magazines and they all need stories. Right. So, you know, be thinking about, I always say to my clients, be thinking about the two or the five or the 10 things that you want the world to know about mm -hmm. your book or your company or your brand or your life and always pepper it with um what is family mean to you mm -hmm. if i gave you a free weekend how would you spend it 
because mm -hmm. they don't want to just know about those salad spinners. They want to know about your hike that you took with the little ones and how you strapped in the baby for the first time and you went camping and you ran out of bug spray. That makes you human. So find yeah. those little human nuggets so that we can all fall in love with you. So we will buy a million salad spinners. It's not about the product. It's about falling in love with the person, trusting the person, seeing if you can work together and, and making it all fit. Like, you can tell I love what I do. I really yeah, you're telling stories. You're telling powerful stories the whole time. So this is this is gold. And for everybody listening, write this down. Uh, find Deborah, work with her, and um, yeah, so much that I'm taking away from listening. You know what's funny? This journey that I took on, I started because I got laid off, right? And I didn't know anybody in the space, and I full heartedly believe in the power of connection because of us having this conversation, because the people that are now in my life that I now talk on daily basis, because how my life has changed for the better, because I took the chance to start reaching out to people, haven't heard from probably half of them, but the people that are there changed my life in so much so that I'm considering writing a book on the power of connection, because I truly believe it has, this is what changes the world. Like if you oh, make you it and you okay. embrace it. So I'll keep you all posted listening to this. I'll share a little more around that, but um, so powerful, Deborah. For people who are listening, it's like, oh my gosh, Deborah's incredible. I love her advice. I love to work with her more. How can people find you and how can they work with you? Uh, my website is uh, sitting with the stars at godaddysites.com. A uh, little complicated there. My email is probably the easiest, Deborah Wallace at Verizon.net, and it's D E B R A W A L L A C E, all one word at verizon.net. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also on LinkedIn under Deborah Wallace. You'll see Parade Magazine and all this writer stuff. I'm also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, talk about connections really quickly. I was at a QVC event interviewing Ryan Seacrest. It's one Ooh. of my favorites. He was on Kelly and Ryan at the time. And I'm walking around and it's really noisy before COVID, before the bar mitzvah. And I meet a woman named Jamie Kern Lima, who uh, was the founder of It Cosmetics. Yeah, and yeah, I definitely mother, know her. Whew. My mother was a very big fan. And I told my mother in this very crowded ballroom that I'm standing a foot away from Jamie and I'm about to talk to her and she's showing me samples and I'm going to write about her one day. And my mother says, please tell Jamie how much I love her. Uh, you know, the customer service, the products. She was just a big, big fan. I tell Jamie this, we part ways. Well, she wrote two books, one that just came out a few weeks yeah. ago and one about a year, year and a half ago. And when I pitched them to write stories for Parade and other publications, I said, I'm writing to you because my mother loved you and your company. And I see that connection that, you know, my mother has since passed, but you know, when I was going through mm -hmm. her things, there was all this, these cosmetics and it yeah. just put a smile on my face. And my mother was beautiful, fashionable woman whose hair was perfect and the makeup and the outfits and all that stuff, no sweats for her, mm -hmm. no loungewear, you know, just beautiful, even to go to the mailbox. And when I interviewed Jamie, you know, we kind of cheered up. Uh, about that connection with our mother. So we all have the connections in our life and we just don't always notice them or, um, or, or make these heartfelt um, mm. connections. I mean, we, yeah. we, you know, they're there. We just have to find them and notice them and believe in ourselves and what we're doing. And, uh, if anybody watching this wants to reach out by email or, or find me on Instagram or uh, mm -hmm. Facebook, please do. Um, and uh, I'd love to help you with your journey, whoever you are. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for wrapping up this important reminder of just reminding the, the – thank you for wrapping up this important reminder of being human in the pitch. Right, you approach not like, oh, I want to I do this because you're so famous. You're like, here's the human experience that we shared. Here is where I think would be valuable to you. And that was something that made that successful. So beautiful, beautiful wrap up. And here at Right Off Track, we wrap up with three rapid fire questions. So whenever you're ready, let me know. I am. Um, let me take one sip of water. Huh. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> um, let's see. 
favorite story you covered and why? Oh, God. I went to the kosher dairy restaurant of, uh, owned and operated by Steven Spielberg's mother. Uh, I was living in South Florida. I went to L.A. She said no. I said please. She said, all right, call me a couple of days before we went. My husband and I, she fed us everything you can imagine on the menu. Uh, I have pictures with her and um, she just talked about being Spielberg's mom and what it was like, you know, to have given birth to the guy who did Schindler's List and E.T. And um, she was lovely and it was fun. And uh, I've written a lot of stories about her and the family and you know just and years later when i talked to steven spielberg which was such a mind-blowing moment um i was able to say you know that he and his his mom and i broke bread so that was one of the big ones amazing okay you're incredible love this okay how do you handle writer's block any quick tip around that i if the deadline is not imminent like it's not due tomorrow morning. I will give myself a little grace. I'll get the tea and the Hallmark movie or the magazine and, and hang out or spend a little extra time with my son. But it happened last week. I just was tired, the weather, you know, allergies. And at some point I said to myself and my son, it's over. Like the, the, the rest period, you just have to sit there and get something on the page and edit it later, but deadlines are deadlines. And some editors will give you an extra day or two. Nobody's giving you an extra week. So uh, you just have to be disciplined. And uh, if you're not in the mood at two o'clock in the afternoon and you know everything's going on and my son needs me, then eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, put the, you know, put the pedal to the metal and, and get back at it. You just have to make yourself. It's kind of like my life is like a college course. You know, I'm always doing homework. Whenever my son says, I have too much homework. My life is homework. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you don't want to do the writing, then go do the research or go mm -hmm. do the reading or go do something that's going to help you. Or mm -hmm. you, I used to ask my mom, you have three assignments, hard, middle, and easy. My mother took the hard got it out of the way. And then the other two are a piece of cake. I tend to do the easier, the middle and save the hard for last. So I don't know. And clearly it's working. Clearly it's working. So find, find your tune. Okay. Last but not least in the positive sense, going off track is. Going off track opens you to new possibilities. Uh, you know, don't say no. If somebody, you know, I don't do this. Why? Why don't you do that? Is it because you're not a mathematician? Somebody's asking you to do statistics or because you've just never really thought about doing even a piece of it. Like I don't create websites. I write website copy. So saying that I don't do websites would be wrong, but when people come to me and say, well, you know, I have somebody who's going to design it and who's going to put the pictures on and all those tabs and all those technical things, can you do the rest? And I can't. Mm -hmm. So open yourself up to new possibilities. And um, what's the worst thing that can happen? You won't mm -hmm. like it and you won't do it again. Ugh. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for shining an example of what it means to not underestimate oneself, not underestimate others, to find a cause in your life that you truly believe in, and the power of being authentic and showing up to the world and inspiring others. And then, of course, thank you so much for giving us incredible tips for people on different parts of their journey who also want to bring inspiration to others through this channel of media. Uh, Deborah, thank you. And to everybody listening, please share with us, where are you on this journey? What stood out to you? What advice do you have or questions do you have that I'm happy to share with Deborah as well? And as always, thank you so much for coming right off track with us. Let's take over the world together, right off track. Until next time, Deborah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure.